Good afternoon. My name is Joe Schottman. This is the talk, Realigning from Chaotic Evil. Just a little bit about me. I'm a senior security analyst for Truist, formerly bb and I'm a geek. I was a wizard who was killed by a rat. I'll get back to that in a little bit later. I've done a little just about everything at some point or other in IT. I've done application security, pen testing, blue team, red team, purple team, IR, DevOps, operations. I wrote web applications for university and was also sysadmin. So that's given me a kind of wide perspective on a number of different things within both computer IT, IT and security overall. The obligatory disclaimer, I am not speaking on behalf of Truist, bb and or any other entity. All opinions expressed are my own. All the images are believed to be, believed to be public domain, creative commons used with permission or created by me for this presentation. An additional disclaimer, I am not just talking about my employers in this talk. So if you hear me saying bad things about companies, don't look at my LinkedIn and say, well, gosh, I'll never work for any of those companies. Because these are stories gathered from a lot of my friends and peers within a lot of different groups, a lot of the really big names of security. I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there's quite a few companies here that specialize in security. And one other disclaimer, I'm not actually a d and guru. I'm going to misuse some terms. So if you're a really devout geek, you're probably going to get a little bit upset with me. So I threw in this extra slide to let you know that I'm intentionally misusing things here. So why am I giving this talk? There is a growing force that I want to make sure that everyone's aware of in 2020. And that's orcs. If you look here at the Scandalf Magic Quadrant, you'll see that there's a number of things. There's the old undead players, the Windows XP and COBOL are still lurking around. There's advanced persistent dragons coming up. The Gelatinous Cube is the visionaries, but they're not quite in fully to operations. But in that upper right hand corner, definitely orcs. So seriously, why am I giving this talk? If you're wondering if you should watch this talk or bail, the things I'm gonna talk about are trying to give some insight on how to align your security processes with the incentives that drive other people. A reminder on how others perceive security groups and suggestions on how to better work to improve security. So I could have done this as a really dry thing. A more proper sli slide title might have been realign and corporate security objectives to synergize efficiencies. And I think that's at least one or two drinkable offenses for giving talks at security conferences. But if you don't like the D&D theme, you can also think of this in part as how to social engineer your way to security success. So going back to what I was saying, corporations don't often align incentives with increasing security. This talk is an attempt to uh, get people on board with being aware of the problems and then trying to help fix it. When I first started in IT, I talked to a lot with a good friend and he was working at a really big company that does routers. And he was very upset because he had a coworker that would only go after the targets, after the projects that the management was highly incentivizing. So if it was something that he knew he was gonna get rewarded for either financially or with FaceTime with the big wigs, he would do it. And if it's something that he figured out that management didn't care that much about, he basically would put no effort in on it. And my friend was very upset about this and thought it was unjust and unfair. And to an extent, he's right, taken to an extreme. That's a true, that's a valid complaint. But at the core of the problem, if management isn't incentivizing the correct things and doesn't reward doing the things that keeps the business functioning, that's actually a management problem, not necessarily a problem of the individual. In general, what I found is people will do what they're incentivized to do. The big incentives, uh, the corporations and bigger groups or work type groups is what their bonuses are based on, what the performance reviews are based on, that sort of thing. But there's also other incentives like what they incentivize themselves to do. So during this talk, keep in mind both the things that they're gonna be written up for if they don't do or get dinged for, or the things that they get in lar a larger bonus because of but also there's the internal incentives. So there's things like what they get a lot of internal satisfaction from. There's people that will have pet projects that may or may not make sense to put a lot of effort into, but because they really love the technology stack or they've invested a lot of time into it, they may be motivated internally to keep putting a lot of effort into it. 
So to go back to the theme of this, if you're completely unaware of what D&D or ad and is, it's a fantasy role-playing game that's basically a form of collaborative storytelling. And it's mediated by the help of dice. So you get together in a group and you tell a story together. There's a person called the dungeon master who's leading the plot, who figures out what's going to happen. And then different players react to what the dungeon master is describing. As things happen, you roll dice and that determines whether you're successful or not. It was inspired by Tolkien's Lord of the Ring mythos, so it relies heavily on elves and wizards and that sort of thing. It was also uh, used heavily in the uh, Stranger Things TV series, so it's had a resurgence of popularity because of that. As I mentioned earlier, I was a wizard killed by a rat. This was my first exposure to d and I think I was third or fourth grade, and it was a party of one, meaning it was just me and the dungeon master. And I wanted to play something really cool, so I picked a wizard. And within about an hour of gameplay, a rat bit me once and I died. So that was kind of not cool, kind of not fun. D&D has this core concept of alignment, which is what is the character that you're playing's nature? What sort of things do they indulge in? What sort of things motivate them to do things? This is a fun comic I found from a gentleman, Tinker Tanner. As a note, if you're easily offended, this is on the not very offensive scale of his sort of humor. So if you don't enjoy crass humor, do not look up his Instagram. But if you do, he's got a number of things, both D&D and non-D&D themed. Normally in a uh, talk where I'm face to face, I'd be waiting to, I'd be showing the entire comic with the punchline and waiting to hear laugh. So I'm gonna give a moment to read it. And hopefully you're at least slightly amused and there's a chuckle or two out there in the audience. So there's two basic sides of alignment within D&D. And in some ways they align with what you see in corporations. There's the good, the altruistic side, the respect for law, dignity, and tends to make personal sacrifices to help out. Evil is more, is pretty self-explanatory. It's harming, killing others lack of compassion, et cetera, et cetera. There's also a sort of middle ground called neutral. And as you can imagine, it's neutral. Then each one of those has categories where there can be lawful or chaotic sides within each of them. So there's lawful where they do the good things, they follow the rules. And this gets a little bit closer to what we see in some of the corporate alignment that when you're a lawful player within the blue team, you may have to rely on tradition. There may be a lack of ad adaptability. And on the other opposite side, there's chaos that's completely unbridled. They don't care about anything. There's no rule following. An example I use here, you can be lawful and evil at the same time. So if you're working for a foreign government's APT or even our government's APT, and you're going out, you may be doing things that are illicit. You may be hacking other company countries and companies, but you're still following by the rules. There's probably some kind of HR guidebook that you have to follow. If you don't, if you step outside of those rules, you may be fired or more severely disciplined. Then there's the complete chaos, the script kiddies who are just out for the lulls, the people who want to just DOS things, have a good time, make a lot of money. That's more the chaotic evil side of things. When you're putting together a group for your AD and D, you want to have similar alignments. In this uh, illustration I found on Flickr, if you have a bunch of good characters and you have a bunch of evil characters and you try to put them in the same group, the story that you tell is not gonna have good synergy. It's gonna be a conflict between the two sets of players back and forth rather than between the, what the dungeon master, the game master is trying to set up and the players working together as a team. You get the necromancers together and the clerics together and they're just gonna fight. Offensive security, application security, red teaming, often is you're getting to play that you're evil. It's the fun part, it's a glamorous part of the job. When I say red team, in the context of this talk, I'm just using it as offensive security in general. True red teaming is more adversary emulation, but the 
industry has kind of adopted the term red for offensive and blue for defensive, so I'm using that within the talk. You get a lot of the glamour, you get a lot of the good pay, you get to go to the fun conferences. And this can lead to some, the blue team, the defensive side can feel like you're actually the, the adversary rather than just emulating it. You're causing them problems. At the end of the day, if you're making their lives harder, there's not that much difference between in how they perceive you between you and an actual evil person out to get money or disrupt the business. There's some common red team incentives that I've seen. It can be objective based, so it can be hack the box, get shell, get root, get domain admin. It could be to generate scary reports that can be handed off to auditors or off to management that says, we got into the systems and we got millions of credit card informations and read CEO's private emails. Or it could simply be quantitative, like do n number tests within a given quarter. Going back to the blue team, I'm going to use blue as a generic term for good. A lot of the time people think of the blue team as just being the SOC analysts, but it has, also has threat intel and things like forensics and malware analysts. To an extent, the developers, the DevOps, the operations teams also function as the blue team because they're doing things that actually tighten down the security and do the things that can help detect or detect ongoing risk that the SOC is missing. The blue team is a lot more restrained than the red team. So the red team often gets to go out and choose what they want to attack, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it, that sort of thing. The blue team, especially the SOC, is often the entry point into the security group. There's often, specific to the SOC, long shifts. There's not necessarily a lot of training given. And again, I'm not just talking about my companies, but across the industry, this is one of the big complaints. There is a common refrain that people, management will worry that if we give the blue team training that they're going to go find a better job. And the fact is, if we don't give them training and let them advance, the good SOC analysts are going to leave and get better jobs anyway. There's problems with lack of advancement. There's not necessarily a clear way to go from a junior SOC analyst position moving up into either offensive security or into a more advanced SOC at opportunity. There's not necessarily a lot of opportunities to learn and experiment. You may be on a really locked down workstation. There may be a small number of tools. I got into a discussion on a SANS mailing group a couple of years ago where people were advocating letting the SOC analysts have any sort of tool that they wanted in their specific instance, in their specific workstation and have different ways of working. I argued back hard that you do need to lock SOC staff down to a standard set of tools because especially at the enterprise scale, they need to be interchangeable. If someone is out, you need to be able to have someone else swap in and work. And if you're using different tool sets and different methods, that just doesn't work. And because it's not the glamorous part of the job, there's often not a lot of funding, both for things like tools, for the salaries themselves, and for the fun trips to Vegas, that sort of thing. So the blue team is differently aligned. They may actually fall under completely different management than the red team. So smaller companies may, both the blue team and the red team, while there may be no differentiation between the two teams, or they may both report the same manager, but at the enterprise scale, they may have completely different management chains reporting to the CISO. And that can lead to conflicts because that, those management chains can have different opinions on what needs to be done. They can have completely different metrics and incentives. The blue team metrics are often things like the number of tickets closed. And that can be problematic because that creates an incentive. If you don't create that many tickets, you can have a really high percentage close rate. It could be the reaction time to alerts. And the most important one probably for the blue team is not appearing in their newspapers as having been owned. So these two sets of alignments and interests and can lead to problems. The blue team can see the red team as a force of chaotic evil. The red team can see the blue team as not being flexible, being too tied down to lawful order, and not being able or willing to adapt to changes. Some other groups within IT have their own incentives. Developers are generally not incentivized for security. Their bonuses generally are dependent on things like, is the system stable? Or is 
their new features. At a previous company, we had an interesting experience where we had the operations group just on call and the programmers had little responsibility for dealing with problems. So they would add new feature after new feature after new feature. And the people who are on night duty would be paged sometimes dozens of times in the night. And it was really terrible. So as an example of relining incentives, what we did was we made the developers also be on the night pager duty so that they were also getting woken up every time the system crashed. And would you believe that the system stability went up dramatically? And that's not just a win for the people who want to sleep at night on the operations team. It was a win for the customers who needed stable, secure, stable software at the same time. The operations group are often incentivized by uptime or speed to deployment rather than security. So there's often conflict in security when you say that, you know, we need to get this patch pushed and it's going to take five, six hours for whatever reason to do that update. And the operations group, they can't afford that six hours of downtime in their performance review. So they're going to push it back and say, well, can we defer that for a month or two and do two months worth of patches at the same time? Management, particularly management outside of security, is often incentivized not to hear from security at all. If, especially if you're in a regulated environment, there's a regulatory risk. If you know about a security problem and don't fix it, that can actually be worse for you than not knowing about it at all. So sometimes management just doesn't want to hear from security or if they hear from it, they're going to push back and say, what's the minimum that we can do? So an example of a perverse incentive, these by the way are uh, some of the dice for my misspent days in seventh and eighth grades playing way too many role-playing games. That one on the left is a rare 30 cider that I had to trade some pretty dear things to get and was the crown jewel of my dice collection as a young teenager. So if you're not familiar with it in systems operations, nines refers to percentage of uptime. So two nines is 99% uptime, which allows a substantial amount of downtime over the course of a year. Three nines is 99.9, four nines, 99.99, 99 et cetera. And one of the mythical goals in operations is five nines, which is something like a few minutes of downtime a month at most. A company I was working for decided that they needed to have five nines of uptime for the storage array. So they bought some very, very nice, very expensive, very redundant storage. And it was capable of delivering the five nines uptime as the ability of the system to run. However, because it was so expensive, the operations group didn't have enough space to offer the developers and administrators enough space to work with. So in practice, we had about 95% uptime because periodically someone would fill up the entire disk array doing something and no one would be able to get work done until we figured out who had created the disk denial of service, track them down and get things deleted. However, initially the operations group didn't fix it because the metric they were judged on was based on the NAS uptime rather than the actual availability. Changing that so that both they got the funding to have the proper amount of space, but also that it was based on functional uptime rather than just system uptime was an example of realigning things to make things actually work. So a lot of this is way beyond our ability to change the security practitioners. If I could wave a magic wand and say that, you know, obviously we need to do things differently at my corporation, there's a few things I might change here and there but I don't have that power. You probably don't have that power. I'm offering this in hopes that, you know, you can bring this up in your individual performance reviews, you can talk with your peers about it, and that over time we can start to affect change. Moving away from incentives that look good on paper, are easy to quantify, but don't necessarily increase security, that's not a big win for the organization, and that should be our actual goal. One way to do this is to learn to good, tell, tell a good story. Think about what incentivizes people, especially if you're working on the offensive side of things. If you go to someone and say you have to do this change, if you have to fix this vulnerability, that's taking away from the things that they're probably incentivized to do, like that uptime, like adding new features. So tell them a compelling story about why it's an important security consideration. Make sure that you're not just dogmatically following 
well, this vulnerability scanner says it's important. Look at it in the context so you can say, this is how a attacker would realistically exploit things. Make it understandable to them on how it's going to affect their ability to do other things because they may have to drop everything and write an emergency patch if it get exploited. Or if a system does get compromised, that system may be off for a week or two in the worst case if they have to pull it down, do a lot of forensic analysis and figure out how the attacker got in. Rather than simply saying, as a security practitioner, you have to do this, make it a compelling story with that collaboration back and forth with them. At the same time, if you're on the defensive side, if someone comes and says you have to fix things, if you have a valid reason why that you can't fix it right away, let them know rather than just saying no. If we can increase the dialogue back and forth, we can increase security for everyone. So a lot of the adventures in D&D start in the tavern. One thing I've got a lot of mileage out of in my career is I'll have lunches with different groups. This doesn't necessarily, or obviously doesn't work so well with distributed groups, but I know people, especially in the current days, are actually doing casual lunch meetings over Zoom and talk about non-work things. If you meet with other people who do other aspects of security than what you do, you'll start to learn more about the industry. You'll learn more about what motivates them, what their problems are. And I'll have, you know, reach out to people who do things like accounting just so I can better understand what are the problems they deal with? What do they care about? What motivates them? And building a professional rapport by doing this sort of thing also helps when you go and say, okay, I really need you to stop what you're doing because there's this important security thing that you may not understand the importance of. But if you have that personal experience working back and forth, or casual personal experience working back and forth, talking about friends, family, the sort of things that you care about casually, that can lead them to taking you more more seriously professionally. You can recruit new members in D&D. So as you find that you want more players in the game or different players drop out, you may go looking for friends to come and join the campaign or the group that you're playing with. If you work at, reach out to these other people and other aspects of the company, you can get those good working relationships. It gives you more eyes. The SOC alone can't find every problem because there may not be, there's context specific things within logs they may not even realize a security event. There's been times that we've had to people who are developers or in operation, general operations say, hey, I noticed anomalous thing that doesn't seem quite right and brought it to the security groups. And digging in, we were able to recognize that it was an incident and that was happening. But if we didn't have those boots on the ground of the people that weren't supposed to be doing SOC or analyst type work, we wouldn't have ever known about it. It also gives you domain knowledge about risks. I work in big banking, so there's a lot of aspects of things like insurance that I don't necessarily understand. I'm a computer person. If I talk with the people that do banking day in and day out and they can say, hey, this is how I think a bad guy could take money out of the bank, they may have ways that I've never thought about that I can then conduct a red team experiment and say, okay, do we actually have a way to detect this? Would this work? Should we start being concerned about that? Building these interpersonal relationships can give you a lot of information that really helps like that. D&D has a concept of multi-class. So you might be, like I mentioned, I was briefly a wizard. You can be a fighter, which is just the generic people with swords that go around hitting things. As you advance within the game, you can become a little bit of both. So you could be a fighter wizard, and there's a concept that's pretty popular or increasingly popular these days called security champions, where you reach out to people within the different groups. They may be developers, they may be operations, and you give them additional training, you give them additional incentivization to focus on security. So they are the eyes and ears within the group, both feeding the information that you need, but helping spread the word about good security. So in the development group, if you give them the good expensive training on how to write secure code, they can work doing the one-on-one -on -one mentoring with other people on the team that you can't afford to send everyone to the training, but they can bring that knowledge back and share it with them. So reaching out and breeding the security champions without, within the group can really help. A fellow I know through SANS, Derek Rook had an interesting experience where he started doing lockpick training as a way to just kind of reach out to different people and do something that was a little bit fun, a little bit security, and it, obviously unrelated to the day-in-day -day security of the company he was working for at the time. But he found that the people who got really interested in doing the lockpicking also started developing 
thoughts about how, especially with physical security, the company could be breached. So he had good information from people like administrative assistants who would come and say, hey, you know, this key badge system has the following flaws that someone could exploit it. So he bred that security champions through just kind of throwing out something fun and non-work related that helped create the security, the boost for security within this company. So a buzzword that I use a lot, perhaps too much is purple team. As CODIS has at one point referred to me as Mr. Purple, and it's the idea of bringing both the red team and the blue teams together as a single color. And to me, this is a big part of the realignment is that there is no separate purple team. You know, there might be one person in a large enterprise whose job is to do coordination, but purple teaming is just having the red and blue teams work together effectively. It's getting together and increasing the effect of, of the other by working hand in hand rather than working in opposition to each other. And by doing so, you create a feedback loop where you can more rapidly iterate and find things and fix them rather than working separately and maybe not having that synergy. And the big focus is that rather than having these goals that might be the one, the goals I talked about for red and blue teams is having goals to increase the security of the organization. And I kind of, I always worry about saying, people saying to me, well, everything you're saying is completely obvious. You know, the teams should be working back hand in hand. But in practice, and again, I'm not just talking about my employers, I'm talking about gathering information from a lot of people in a lot of different companies and a lot of the different industries. In practice, the two teams don't necessarily work all that well together or all that often. And why is this important? There's a framework that CrowdStrike is pushing, the 11060 framework. The goal is that your company or enterprise or organization should be able to, in one minute, detect there's been an intrusion. Within 10 minutes, you should be able to launch an investigation, and within 60 minutes, you should be able to respond. And why do we need this one minute detection and rapid ability to respond? In the 2019 report they did, they analyzed a number of different APTs, and at the worst case with the Russian APTs, they were saying that from the initial intrusion, getting that foothold, they were able to start pivoting around to other systems on the network within 19 minutes. So if you didn't have at least some ability to respond within 10, you might have multiple systems compromised. With the complexity of large modern organizations, you more or less have to assume that attackers are going to get in. The days of imagining that a firewall is perfect, that people aren't going to click on that malicious file, that people aren't going to reuse passwords. You can't count on that. The big important thing is how quickly can you respond after that initial incident? How quickly can you get it locked down? And how can you keep them from pivoting once they start, you start moving around? Interestingly, they suggest that the North Koreans were the second fastest and the Chinese were third fastest. That may or may not be true. I've seen some very fast action from Chinese actors at various points, but, and CrowdStrike is a service provider that wants to sell you products and services, so take this with a grain of salt, but attackers do start moving around very quickly once they get that first foothold. A problem that I've seen with large-scale purple team exercises is if you start just taking a red team exercise and put the blue team on it and say, okay, this is now a purple team exercise, it can be really daunting, especially when there's a visibility gap early in the chain. If the attackers get in and they're not detected and they start pivoting around and they're not detected and they get domain admin and they're not detected, if you're saying there's a blue team, it's really easy to say, throw up your hands and say, there's too much to do. We've been saying that there's these visibility gaps forever and nothing gets fixed. This whole exercise is pointless. So to me, a key point in trying to fight this is reducing scope. And an excellent way of doing this is the attack matrix. It's, this is a framework for analyzing how attackers typically move through different organizations. It's created by MITRE. It's an ongoing process that's collaborative between MITRE and a number of different organizations. So it's constantly changing, constantly updating. And it gathers different techniques that attackers use, analyzes how they do it in different phases of the big attacks. It's really nice because it's granular and then it gives specific examples of how it works. It's more or less a successor to the cyber killer chain that Lockheed Martin created, 
that was a good start, but didn't give a lot of visibility into exactly how the tax would be done within it. And also having no knowing fact that it was trademarked, so technically if you wanted to do the follow up the law, you had to add that little trademark symbol every time you used it. So it goes left to right, top to bottom, and it examines ways that large or sophisticated attackers typically go through organizations. And this doesn't, not every single segment hacker and something who knows just a script can be used just smashing, grabbing, or having some balls may not do all of these. But if you're worried about serious attackers, about the APTs and that kind of thing, typically you're going to see most of these done in a successful intrusion. And the first three and the last two are the two key choke points or choke areas as far as I'm concerned for making sure that you've got the ability to detect. I mean, you want to have as much visibility and capability to detect all of these, but those are the two important things, detecting that they've gotten in the first place and detecting that they're starting to move your crown jewels out of your organization. So this is just a small part. If I included the entire matrix, you'd have to squint really, really, really hard to read all of these. But you can see that each segment has free, some examples. So the initial compromise might be a drive-by download. After that, they might use Apple script to execute additional malware, use accessibility features to establish a persistence mechanism, et cetera, et cetera. If this is of interest to you, I definitely recommend going to the website and taking a look and start to think about what applies to your organization. Many of these examples are specific to Windows, if you are specific to Mac. So you can go through and say, our group just doesn't have to care about this at all because we're a Linux and OS 10 shop exclusively, or we only use Windows, so we don't have to worry about the bash profile type attacks. It'll give you some visibility on how to start thinking about what attackers are going to do and where your choke points are, where your visibility gaps might be, and where your mitigations should be. So if you happen to have gotten all fired up about attack, there's a conference that I've done twice now, Bider hosted it, called AttackCon. It was last fall, but they have online archives of both 2019 and 2018. So if you want to start exploring how you can start really doing a lot of work with this, I recommend checking that out. So going back to the purple team concept, what I recommend is granular tests, have the red and blue teams working together and go through the attack matrix and figure out what the likely way that an attacker is going to attack or where a visibility gap might exist and check out just that single place. Don't spend a lot of time trying to do an entire simulated attack if you know that you're going to fail pretty early on. Do the test and then work together to mitigate that single issue rather than going on and do an entire campaign. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you have the ability to detect and mitigate on your, all your network segments, especially if you're large enterprise. And as an extra, extra, extra disclaimer, I spend most of my time on large enterprises, large groups, so I do tend to be enterprisey. So I'm used to working in an organization that has many subs and affiliates. We're actually going through a giant merger right now. So we're taking two giant networks and combining them into one. So you can't necessarily assume that just because you have detection in your core network or this one part of your network, you can detect it everywhere. So definitely make sure that all of your key seg network segments has the ability to detect things. And if you don't have the ability to do that detection, work together on creating that, that signature. If you're on the offensive side, don't just hand off to the blue team, hey, you've got this problem, go fix it. Work with them to make sure that they can do it so that they're not spending a lot of time learning the tools that you know, but they may not know very well. And PowerPoint has gone wonky. Please drop in and let me know if we haven't advanced to the slide that says responsive reactions and repeatability. I'll continue and assume that it's actually working properly for the conference. Uh, we're on slide. 50 of 66. Okay. Um, it just shows the HTTPS MITRE.org attack con. Now we're seeing you, which is fine. Okay, perfect. 
All right, that's actually much better on the slides. So in thinking about the framework, it's about responsive reactions and repeatability. Do that test. If it can be detected, is there a playbook for it? Playbook, if you're not familiar, is generally a term used by the SOC that when something happens, when there's a trigger and something's detected, exactly what steps you follow. Like I was saying earlier, you want your SOC to be highly, autom highly automated if possible and highly regimented, regimented if you have multiple analysts so that things aren't dependent on how one person does it. If there's the playbook, work together to make sure the playbook actually works to contain the attack. If the playbook was written by someone who didn't have, have enough knowledge on how to stop the attack, you may think that you know how to do it, but it doesn't work. So make sure that it actually does that. If it doesn't work, work together to revise the playbook and repeat the test to ensure that the controls are solid and repeatable. So a classic example of people fixing things incorrectly is what I think of as the one equals one vulnerability, where if you're not familiar, SQL injection uses logic errors. So you can do things like add one equals one to a SQL query and get every piece of information out of the database rather than the one you're supposed to. And oftentimes you would hand a developer, hey, here's a case where if you use this following string, this web form, it hands back the entire database. And they write a fix that says, okay, if one equals one is within the string, assume it's malicious and kill it. But if you use two equals two or one is greater than zero, anything that they didn't have that hard coded fix for, it would still work. So as on the offensive side, trust but verify, assume that they did good work, but modify the test enough to make sure that they didn't make a hard coded test, that hard coded fix that fixes just that one specific case that worked previously to make sure that things, the gap is actually closed. Yeah. So a benefit of doing this purple team approach, there's a lot of information sharing that will help both sides have knowledge that can help the other. So an example of this is <clears throat> I've had developers say, hey, I know that there is a problem with such and such library and we've not been able to get enough points on the Agile board. This, by the way, was not the current company to get it fixed. Can you help prove that there's a vulnerability with it so that we can make sure that it actually gets fixed? They cared about the security, they cared about the stability of the system, but they couldn't necessarily get it handled. So by coming to me, I was able to get it taken care of. Had I not been told that insider information about what library that they were using, I wouldn't necessarily know that that particular type of attack would work. It breaks down the silos, it makes the testing more accurate and gives better control. So if someone who really knows the logs goes through the attack afterwards and says, hey, this looks like it might have actually worked. There's something like blind SQL injection that I might have run and not detected that it worked that the logs would show. The developers or the operators can come to me and say that it would work. And I think this cooperation is important. The bad guys have a lot of time on their side. If you're a big enterprise, if you have a lot of money, if you're, you have intellectual property that's worth stealing, if disrupting you would be worth a lot of money and they can block, block, blackmail you, they can spend weeks or months, maybe even a year, figuring out how to get into your system. Your organization has cooperation on its side. Take as many opportunities to level the field as you can. One way of doing this, or a fun thing that you can do to start breaking down this uh, blue is only good aspect, is set up a cyber range, which I realize saying cyber is probably another drinkable offense, but let the blue team step outside of just doing the good stuff, outside of using the standard tools, set up something outside of your organization so that there's no chances of things going wrong, set it up in AWS or Azure, what have you, or just a dedicated virtual lab within your company where they can use Kali, see what the malicious tools actually look like, let them execute attacks. I've seen this work really well with developers who may not understand exactly what cross-site scripting is because you know, okay, so you can pop an alert box saying, one, what's the big deal? What's the impact of that? If you let them play around and use Beef, the browser exploitation framework, and see just how much you can do with just JavaScript, that's really eye-opening to them, and they can start actually being a lot more secure because they've had this 
hands-on experience in the cyber range, seeing what the tools do and how they work. And also works to help provide that internal career path. So <clears throat> most people want to move up. Most people don't want to be sitting in a 12 hour sock shift for the rest of their lives. Giving them the additional tools lets them do their better job, do the job better so they can become a higher level analyst or move into something more offensive and get those glamorous positions. I've seen a lot of value for pairing up people on the defensive and offensive side and doing write-alongs where you're sitting side by side in some cases. Talking things out, seeing how the tools work can help appreciate and understand the challenges that both sides have. It creates that feedback loop where someone can say, hey, I just did such and such. Did you see it in your logs? And they can immediately go and look. And if there's nothing in the logs, if there's nothing flowing to the sim, you know right then and there you've got a problem that needs to be addressed. This helps the red team. You can learn the playbooks so that you can start thinking about how to work around them and make sure that those playbooks actually do what people think that they do. The blue team learns the tactics, techniques, and procedures that the offensive side is going to do. And that's not just the red team offensive side, but the real world attackers and how to de detect them. Awesome. I see from the bottom side that PetroPoint didn't save it. So my apologies for saying besides RDU. Look for signatures, ways that you can make things similar. For the development operation side of things, see if you can get management on board with providing vulnerability remediation as the performance metric. Make sure that at the end of the day that they're not going to get their bonus or they're going to get a bad review if they don't include the vulnerability remediation. And if they do, or if they do things like proactively reach out to you, that they'll get a better bonus. Push applications testing left. This is a big buzzword within application testing at the moment. If you think of things as left to right from the development early process to the right hand side being the actual release candidate running, the earlier in the process you can get things caught, the better. In some cases, we're integrating tools into the developers' IDEs as they work. So that as they write a piece of code that's going to have SQL injection, right then and there it pops up and says, hey, you just did something bad, fix it. That's incredibly cheap compared to having it get into the release cycle and having to go back and the developers forgotten how the code works. They have to switch context and figure out how to rewrite it to fix the code. Provide logging feedback during development. So if someone on the blue team says, we need to know what sort of things are happening when in our logs to be able to detect a breach, if you tell developers, they can make sure that that's actually part of the log format. From the offensive side, only require re remediation of the actual serious issues. A lot of tools will run and gener generate hundreds, dozens, or thousands of fixes of vulnerabilities. If you dogmatically say that everything that's ranked as a medium has to be fixed, they're just not going to get things done. Make sure that you're being realistic and get the important things addressed, but leave enough time for the other things that they actually care about. Try to deliver actionable reports, if possible, integrate it into their tracking system. If you can put a bug into JIRA right then and there, that there's a SQL injection issue, that helps integrate with their workflow. And that just makes everyone's job easier if it doesn't have to go cut and paste from this report by this project manager through several layers of tools. I'm going to step aside from the D&D metaphor for just a moment to talk about the Hubble tank, which is a concept that I'm borrowing from massive multiplayer online role-playing games, more because such as EVE Online, EverQuest, and of course, World of Warcraft. If you're not familiar, the uh, characters called tanks are generally the characters that exist to take lots and lots of damage so that other elite characters can do the fun stuff. So it's not that they can't be fun, but generally you're not being getting to throw spells around and do that sort of thing. You're up front, you're getting assaulted left and right, and the wizards are standing behind you having firing off the spells. This is the lesson I learned by that whole rat biting incident that I keep mentioning for no good reason, is that the wizard by themselves, the offensive security person, standing alone could not succeed. The red team gets the glory, gets a lot of the grammar, but at the end of the day, I can create vulnerabilities and I can find risks, 
but I'm not doing the work that actually gets things done. It's the SOC staff who does the actual detection of if an actual attack does occur, and it's the people doing the development and operation side who get things actually fixed. So I'm getting to do the fun stuff on the offensive side, and they're kind of tanking, and I think that we don't actually take that, appreciate that quite enough as an industry. So do your best to make them feel appreciated, spend time mentoring them, explain to them rather than telling them. If you sit down and say, there's this problem and fix it, they may or may not fix it, but it doesn't mean that they can explain, they can explore and find some of the things on their own. If you go through and make sure that they really understand what's going on, they may spot the other things that you missed during your testing in other parts of the code that you just didn't get to or in something that used borrowed code that you're not aware of. Push management for the training and advancement opportunities for them. And just say thanks. Like I said, they do a lot of the thankless work. They have really long shifts typically, and there's a lot of burnout that I've seen within SOX. So at the end of the day, just making them feel appreciated can pay off. So wrapping up, I definitely want to say thanks to Yvette, Andy, and the other two people whose names are on a slide that got it eaten by PowerPoint. I know that this was a big dramatic shift with having to go to an online format, and I'm sure that there's other volunteers that put in a lot of work also helping make this happen. So a big thanks to them for bending over backwards to make sure this happened rather than just canceling. Thanks to the sponsors, especially for making sure that there was funding to continue to do things that the organizers didn't eat any costs. I know that it, there's probably temptation to back out, so I definitely appreciate that. Thanks to all the other speakers who made sure that they could do the online presentations and trying to persevere in the face of adversary. And thanks to everyone who attended. So a few takeaways. Explore what behaviors your company incentivizes both for your team and others. Try to figure out how to realign those bad incentives if you can. And if you can't personally do it, make sure that you're talking to management and saying, hey, we're seeing this problem and I think it's because the developers or the operations team are not made to appreciate and incentivize to care about it. So here's why we should get senior management on board with changing that. As a practitioner, say to yourself when you're doing something, does this actually result in better security? There are some things that you just have to do, particularly within regulated environments where the auditors say you must do something and whether or not increase the security, you do it. But for things that you have freedom of choice over, choose the things that will have big impact rather than things that just say, okay, I did a test and I found 20 different serious vulnerabilities and I made them fix them all. Break down the silos, share that information back and forth so it's a collaboration between the red and blue teams rather than working in opposition to each other. And definitely as much as you can, take care of those people on the front line. I know that we're gonna move the questions to Slack. Yeah, we, um, there's lots of comments and, and questions about your presentation. Um, I think you had some really very cool key points that people really latched onto. Um, and I know everybody enjoyed the D&D aspect. Um, even though you up front said, I don't play D&D, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> uh, I think you had great references and uh, we appreciate it. So um, I, oh. There's a question, how do you manage the purple team sort of realignment with external or consulting red teams? I don't know if you wanna answer that immediately or just jump into Slack. If there's time, I'm happy to do a couple of questions live. Okay. Just briefly, since I had the uh, problems with the slide deck and I think a couple slides got missed entirely, I will happily tweet out a link later if people want to download the slide deck and there's speaker notes so they can actually see most of what I talked about within the speaker notes as well. My Twitter is mostly read only, but it accepts DMs. So you're welcome to add me or just drop me a line, add me on LinkedIn I'm, and I probably stick a link out there. As far as working with the external groups, we will, we're making a big push to work with boutique groups that really want to help us increase security rather than just deliver compliance checkboxes. I'm sure people have had some problems with, if you've been in this field for a while, some consulting companies exist because they're a PCI QSA company 
and they're hired by companies that they just want that checkbox and they run an SS scan and they may format the report and call it a proper pen test, but in reality, it's just compliance. We're finding the vendors that deliver quality and we're making sure that they're aware that our goal is to actually increase the security. We tell them that we're heavily focused on the wider framework and the cyber kill chain. And so as they do pr information presenting to frame it in that context so that we can work it into our workflows. And when possible, we will have them do on-site work so that we can have the people working on the company side by side with them or working in close collaboration with them rather than remote pen testing. Um, all right. I don't know if it just makes more sense for you to either look at Slack or if you just want to go into Slack and just start answering the questions um, directly. Lots of good feedback on your presentation. So we truly appreciate it. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we appreciate your time and your attention and your cool slides. So um, with that, mm -hmm. I'm going to turn it over to the other um, besides organizers. I'm going to mute you, Joe, and appreciate your time and attention. Thank you so much. Thanks.